Okay, so today um, I've got kind of an unusual project. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk about trash, basically. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the role that rubbish played in transforming the Department of Vertebrate Paleontology, uh, that's the Vertebrate Paleontology Department at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, in transforming their dinosaur program from what was essentially uh, a collecting and display program, that was the original concept, into a legitimate research program that would rival and eventually surpass the much older and better established program at Yale's Peabody Museum. All right, so once again, it's probably not going to come as, any, as a surprise to anybody who knows my work. Once again, this is a story about uh, Osborne versus Marsh. And so I, I thought I'd begin by introducing the main antagonists, at least very briefly. Uh, so on the right side, we've got uh, a portrait of um, Henry Fairfield Osborne. He was the founder and first curator of the Department of Vertebrate Paleontology at the American Museum in New York. This is a portrait of him as a relatively young man, an early professional. I think this was taken in 1891, right about the time that, um, that he uh, established this department in New York. So he's a, a rising professional. Uh, Osborne, for those of you who don't know, comes from a very wealthy New York family, very well connected. Uh, his uncle was J. Pierpont Morgan. Does that name ring a bell? Your money is probably still tied up with J. Pierpont Morgan. So the, he wasn't lacking for money in the Osborne family. His father was the president of the Illinois Central Railroad, connected to other railroads as well, uh, very well socially connected, uh, very rich. His dad wanted him to become a businessman, right? Uh, but when Osborne expressed an interest in uh, academia, uh, his father acquiesced, but he insisted that Osborne create an, an, an empire of science, right? So he wanted his son to be an emperor. Uh, in science. And so this is a very ambitious man, right? And he's driven in part by his father, a very ambitious father. And on the left side, we've got a portrait of Othniel Charles Marsh, um, arguably the only paleontologist more famous than Henry Fairfield Osborne. So this is a portrait of Marsh uh, from the 1880s, which is roughly the height of his power. Um, Marsh was, had a somewhat different background from, uh, from Osborne. Marsh came from actually a poor family. But the one thing they had in common that was key to their success is that Marsh's uncle was also fabulously rich. Marsh's uncle, Marsh's mother's brother, was George Peabody, uh, probably the richest man in America until J.P. Morgan. Uh, so they both had, a, had it pretty easy when it comes to finances. Uh, George Peabody took a, a, an interest in Marsh's life. He sent him to school. He paid for his schooling. And then it was his philanthropy that landed Marsh his, the, the first position as a paleontologist, a professional paleontologist in the United States at the Yale Peabody Museum, right? When you're Peabody's nephew and there's a job opening for a paleontologist, well, you got a leg up. So he gets a job at the, at the Yale Peabody Muse Museum and at Yale, uh, and he very quickly establishes his new paleontology program as the dominant one in the United States. Uh, he uh, becomes involved in federal science. He gets a lot of patronage from the government. He's he becomes extremely well-connected, well-known. Uh, he was a very powerful figure in American science, probably, arguably one of the most powerful figures in the natural sciences in America in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, Osborne wanted to duplicate his success. Now, um, one of the ways that Marsh became so successful, of course, was by uh, exploiting the fossil resources of the U.S. West. And one of his most important sites was Como Bluff in Wyoming. And this is going to be the scene of much of the action of today's story. And so in the background here, we, we've got an Arthur Lake's watercolor portrait of, uh, sorry, landscape of uh, Como Bluff. So this is what Como Bluff looked like uh, to Arthur Lake's. I, I, this is a fabulous painting. Now, Marsh uh, extracted uh, uh, a lot of very famous, very important specimens from Como Bluff. It was arguably his most important field locality. Brontosaurus excelsus, the type specimen, comes from Como Bluff. Many other specimens do, too. Uh, but despite the fact that he extracted a lot of great stuff from this site, he event eventually the yields started to decline, right? And so he abandons this field site in the late 1880s uh, voluntarily, right? Uh, he just lets it go and, and starts exploring other places. Now, this, of course, creates an opportunity. So when the Department of Vertebrate Paleontology in New York is founded in 1891, 
Osborne senses a chance to uh, maybe duplicate some of Marsh's success, as I've already mentioned. So when the DVP, I'm going to call it the DVP from now on because the Department of Vertebrate and Paleontology is a real mouthful. So when the DVP goes to reopen Marsh's old quarries at Como Bluff, Osborne, who's here on the right in the background, Osborne uh, shows up, does a publicity visit, a supervisory visit, if you will. Uh, of course, he was also intending to do a, a little bit of digging, of, of, with the emphasis on little. Um, and in fact, uh, so a, a closer examination of this picture uh, reveals that Osborne has, he's got no tools in his hands, for instance, no shovel, no pick, no, no hammer. Uh, he's, it, he appears to be wearing a relatively nice coat, maybe a dress coat, and almost certainly dress gloves, right? These are pretty nice outfits for field work, even in the 19th century. Uh, so I'm guessing that Osborne didn't get his hands very dirty at Como Bluff, all right? Instead, the work was done by a, a pair, well, at first, a pair of relative newcomers to the DVP. Um, so this guy, uh, this guy is relatively famous. Of course, he would become very famous later for his prowess as a dinosaur collector. Uh, I'm guessing in a crowd like this, everybody knows who this is. No? <laughs> Archaeologist? Okay. This is, this is Barnum Brown. Okay, uh, okay, now everybody knows who it is. Okay, so this, this is Barnum Brown, so I'm kind of surprised. Uh, but, but perhaps you don't recognize him because, you know, he comes to be known as maybe the greatest dinosaur collector of all time, very famous for having collected T-Rex. At this point of his life, he's a nobody. He's a novice. In fact, he's still in college. He hasn't even finished college at this point. So he's a seasonal employee for Osborne at this point. Of course, he would stay with the American Museum for his entire 46-year career, become very famous, but at this point, he isn't. And that's perhaps why you don't recognize him. This is Barnum Brown. Very important figure. Uh, but I'm actually going to focus more of my energies on uh, Barnum Brown's partner in this uh, dig, and that's this pith-helmeted gentleman on the right. Does anybody, if you didn't know who Barnum Brown is, I'm guessing you're not going to know who this is. Does anybody want to venture a guess? Well, that is a good guess, but it's not Peter Kaizen. Nobody? Did no one read my book? <laughs> I, w I mean, I thought in a crowd like this, everybody be, oh, that's, that's, well, so as a matter of fact, it's Harold W. Menke. Does that name ring a bell? At least a little bit. He's, uh, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, Menke is a fairly obscure figure. Even I'll admit that. But I feel like he needs to be better known. And I, that's partly why I wanted to talk about him today. So Menke was, um, he's been you know, largely forgotten, but he, was, he actually had a lot of talents. Menke, unlike Brown, had finished college, for instance. So he had a, a, an undergraduate degree from the University of Kansas. He took classes with Samuel Wendell Williston, one of the more important vertebrate paleontologists of the latter half of the 20th century in America. He was a very skilled field photographer. Uh, a lot of the most famous field photographs from that era were taken by Menke. Of course, they're, not, they're no longer credited to Menke, but we know that Menke took them. He was a bit of an ornithologist. Uh, he's uh, a man of many talents. He worked for a couple of years under Carl Akeley uh, as a taxidermist in Chicago. I would personally love to know more about his work with Akeley, but I can find no records this time. So this is a man, sort of a many talented naturalist who dabbled in a lot of different things and had a lot of success but is more or less forgotten today. Oh, I, I didn't even mention, he was the discoverer of Elmer Riggs' type specimen for Brachiosaurus altithorax. Also the discoverer of the Apatosaurus that's been on display at the Field Museum continuously since 1908. Um, so a lot of, you know, great accomplishments. But yet uh, he's, oh wow, seriously? Okay, uh, I gotta speed this up, okay. <laughs> So, but more or less forgotten today. If anybody remembers his name at all, they probably remember it for Brachiosaurus, but most people don't. I mean, even this crowd didn't. All right, now, um, boy, I really do have to accelerate it for only got 10 minutes. Okay, so Barnum Brown, as I said before, right, is, he's, a, he's a seasonal collector, but he wants a permanent job. And Brown thinks that maybe the way to get it, to get a permanent job at the, at, is, is to make a really conspicuous contribution to the collections at the, in the DVP in New York. And one way he wants to do this is by collecting, making a spectacular collection of dinosaurs. Now, this is an important point. 
It wasn't Osborne, the head of the department, the curator of the department who pushed the department into dinosaurs in the first place. It was underlings like Brown and a few others, but especially Brown. Brown was very interested in dinosaurs and he wanted the DVP to, to make a collection of these, right? Osborne was sort of reluctantly dragged into the dinosaur business. Now the problem with dinosaurs is that collecting them, for those of you who don't know, American Jurassic dinosaurs are enormous. Some of the bones weigh upwards of 800, 900 thousand pounds. To collect dinosaurs, you need more than one guy, right? It's just impossible to collect these things with only one person. So he, he wanted a partner. And he uh, stressed that his Kansas University friend, Harry Menke, was careful, hardworking, and intelligent. A pretty good, uh, th this is how Menke got his, his first seasonal job with the DVP. All right, now, uh, so the DVP's field foreman, Jacob Wartman, had a different assessment of Menke. He, he said, Menke is handy at many things, he concedes, right? Uh, he's a first-class photographer, I already mentioned that, and a fairly good bone, bone man. That's high praise from Wartman, by the way. Uh, but most awfully rough and uncouth. And so, uh, in other words, he's, pretty, he's useful in the field, but he's just a little bit too country for New York City. All right, so probably Menke had no chance, since Wartman is the field foreman, he probably has no chance of getting a job. Uh, the, of course, the other thing that working against him is that Barnum Brown was his friend and Wartman absolutely despised Barnum Brown. So he probably has no hope of getting a job there. But of course, Menke doesn't know this, right? He has no idea. So Menke, like Brown, is vying for a job and he thinks, okay, I, I need something to make me competitive for a permanent job here. And so Menke volunteers, this is incredible, he volunteers to stay behind at the Como Bluff quarry and overwinter from 1897 to 1898. Now, um, for those of you who are not from the US, maybe you don't know much about Wyoming. Remember back to my, one of my earliest pictures of Brown and, and Osborne at the Como Bluff quarry, right? The very famous picture. They're wearing coats and heavy sweaters, right? To be comfortable. That picture was taken in June. So now imagine what the conditions must have been like in January in Wyoming. Terrible, terrible. And not just the cold and the wind and the desolation, right? He, he, he probably didn't talk to anybody for six months. Well, that's probably not true. But he didn't talk to people very often, okay? He was lonely, he was bored. Um, it, it was a tough assignment. I tried to find a picture. He lived in an abandoned section house in Aurora, Wyoming. It doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, I tried to find a picture of an abandoned section house from the 1890s. Turns out it's impossible. I spent hours and hours on this. This is the closest I could come. This is actually a pump house in West Virginia in the 1890s. This is probably the lap of luxury <laughs> compared to the circumstances <laughs> under which Menke was living in the winter of 97, 98. Terrible conditions. All right, now, in addition to safeguarding the quarry from claim jumpers, right, that's his main task, right, just to babysit the quarry, in his idle hours, he was expected to search for um, new Jurassic dinosaur prospects, right, if the weather was nice, which it probably never was. And when the weather wasn't nice, he was sieving through a giant pile of Jurassic matrix looking for tiny teeth and jaw fragments, right? Because Osborne, again, his primary interest is mammals, right, not dinosaurs. This is what Osborne really wants. This is his research interest. Find me more tiny teeth and, and, uh, and jaw fragments from the American Mesozoic, right? And these are just some typical fossils. Now, I should tell you, he wasn't very successful. Uh, again, he couldn't prospect much, was one problem, but the matrix just didn't ha wasn't very fossiliferous. So he, he didn't get a lot of the stuff that was going to win some love from Osborne. Okay, and that's a problem. But he wasn't, it wasn't a complete failure. Okay, he did find at least one very interesting thing. I would argue that the greatest, Menke's greatest find from the winter of 1897, 1898 was a collection of discarded field correspondence, oh boy, of, uh, from Marsh, O.C. Marsh, right, Osborne's Yale rival, to one of his field collectors, a guy named Bar Fred Brown, doesn't matter. Uh, discarded field correspondence. He found this in a, in a rubbish heap in, an old, in a reclaimed quarry that Marsh's collectors had worked in the 1880s. Okay? Fairly interesting stuff. Now, 
Imagine a man spending six months by himself in the winter in Wyoming in a cabin. He's got nothing to do. He's got no diversions. He does what any disreputable historian does as a matter of course. He reads the letters. <laughs> right? I mean, who wouldn't do that? And so it turns out he discovers very quickly that the letters contain very valuable intelligence about the quarries. Right? He immediately thinks, okay, this is something. This is a... This is a contribution I can make to the DVP. So he forwards one of them to Henry Fairfield Osborne. They were in somewhat regular correspondence, of course. Menke wrote like five letters for every letter he got back. Uh, but again, he, at least Osborne would write him sometimes. And this, this is what he says. He says, I enclose, dear sir, I enclose you part of a fossil correspondence which I uncovered from a pile of rubbish. The mammal quarry nine is mentioned, hence I thought you might like to see the letters. Okay, interesting. Osborne recognizes, too, that these are potentially very valuable resources. He writes him back, it will be a good plan for you to forward Professor Marsh's letters. They may be of service to us in indicating the various quarries, and I shall, this is key, and I shall not make any unfair use of them. All right, think about that for a second. What's the, the obvious conclusion here? is that Osborne has every intention of making unfair use <laughs> of any data he, uh, he obtains from these letters, right? And remember the context, right? This is so uh, Cope, uh, Osborne's mentor, uh, Edward Drinker Cope, and the arch rival of Marsh has been dead less than a year. Marsh, ha sorry, Osborne hates Marsh. It's personal. It's not just professional. He hates the guy's guts. And he wants, he sees this as an opportunity to find, to, to get dirt on Marsh to build his own collection of Marshiana, as Cope once called it, right? This is a chance to continue the infamous Cope-Marsh feud. I'm sure you've all heard of that, so I'm not going to say anything about that in the interest of time. All right, so uh, for those of you who think maybe I'm jumping to conclusions here, I'll give you Exhibit B. So here's Exhibit B. Osborne again writes to Megan. He says, I prefer you not mention the letters which you have sent me, as we shall, of course, use them merely for the information they contain regarding quarries. Again, I, I, I think that he, he doth protest too much, am I right? <laughs> but Menke gets, the, he gets it, right? And he writes back, oh, you may be assured I will mention the letters to no one. And as far as I know, he never did. Right? I, I can't find any other correspondence from Menke mentioning these letters. All right, now this is where it becomes really interesting. Um, Osborne has a, 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 there's a policy shift regarding the dinosaur project in the DVP as a result of these letters. That's what I'm going to argue in a minute, if I have time. All right, now, and I'll start with this letter here. So again, Osborne writes to Menke, he says, I started out in these beds with the idea of simply making a collection. In other words, to collect some things, put them on display, wow the crowds. That's the idea. Not expecting to find much that is new. Now I have the idea that we shall make grand additions to our knowledge of these animals, and that Professor Marsh's work is as faulty among the reptiles as it is proved to be among the mammals, and must be reformed and rewritten from top to bottom. This is a pretty interesting statement. So again, we're not just going to put these things in cases. We're going to do new cutting edge research on, on, on American Jurassic dinosaurs, uh, Marsh's area of specialization. He was the undisputed master of American Jurassic dinosaurs. Now, this doesn't seem that extraordinary until you consider Marsh, I'm sorry, Osborne hasn't so much as seen a specimen yet. Not one that I know of. All he's got is Marsh's publications and these letters. And he's concluded, nevertheless, that he now knows <coughs> he can revise and rewrite Marsh's work. That's pretty interesting. All right, so what did Marsh's letter say? Now, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you one example. There are many, but I'm only going to concentrate on one for time's sake. So here's one, and this is a fairly typical letter. This is a letter from 1886 regarding Stegosaurus that Marsh has written to his field collector, Fred Brown. He writes, the diagrams came today and are very interesting. The one with the four spines over the tail is most important, especially if you can tell me what the rest of the skeleton is like. Oh, right. I mean, how many paleontologists wouldn't like that, right? <laughs> Did the two pairs of spines found together last year belong with the tail? Look out sharp for the position of all plates and spines. Pretty mundane. But why is this important? It's important because in 1886, the year that this letter was written, Osborne, sorry, Marsh, still doesn't know what Stegosaurus looked like in life. Right? He has a few ideas. By 1891, though, he puts out his main hypothesis. Right? This is, so this is a marsh reconstruction of what Stegosaurus must look like in life. Note it has this 
single row of, of plates along the sort of the midline of the, of the spine, and it's got four pairs of spikes on the tail. Okay? Now, Osborne, having read about Marsh's doubts about the arrangement of the spikes and the plates in this letter, thinks that this is hypothetical, right? And that this is a potential avenue of attack into Marsh's work. Okay? Here's what he writes to Menke later, right? Very soon after reading these letters. He says, I should be quite interested to hear whether you find that the animal is a stegosaur. This is referring to a specimen that they were developing uh, in, by May. If so, the matter of greatest importance is the exact determination of the position of the plates upon the dorsal vertebrae. If you study Marsh's, you know what, I'm going to skip the rest of that. The important thing here is that he wants his collectors to focus on this one particular question, the arrangement of the plates, also the spikes, but especially the plates. That's key. Uh, confirmation of this view of the case will be of great importance, he says. He stresses this. All right. Uh, oh, I wasn't supposed to click that yet. Uh, I was supposed to make a big point and then boom. <laughs> that's what I was going to do and I forgot what the big point was. Um, uh, yeah, totally blanked. I can't believe it. I, uh, that's just so embarrassing. I was really on a roll too. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so, Again, I want to emphasize that Osborne hasn't seen any dinosaurs yet. This is the spring of 1898, okay? A few things have been collected the previous field season, but they haven't been prepped out yet. Or maybe a few fragments, that's it. And he certainly hasn't seen a stegosaur. Um, and I also want to make the point, and this is kind of interesting, that Osborne later drops this whole avenue of research. As far as I know, he never published anything important about stegosaurus. Uh, and there's two possible reasons for this. Uh, at least two, there's probably all kinds of possible reasons, but two that come to mind. First is that this specimen that he mentioned here, right, uh, interested in whether you find the animal is a stegosaur, this turned out not to be a stegosaur. Uh, it was just fragments of a stegosaur. So it, there was stegosaurus material, but nothing diagnostic, nothing significant. And so he realized he simply didn't have the material basis with which to attack Marsh's work, right? He just didn't have it. Um, but important reason number two, and I think the most important reason by far, is that Marsh died 10 months after this, surprisingly, he was still relatively young, dies uh, suddenly 10 months after this, and all of a sudden the personal motive, two minutes? Or I'm two minutes over? Two minutes. Oh, great. I'm going I'm to make it. <laughs> um, I can't believe it. Uh, I lost my train of thought again. Uh, so, oh, the other read. So Marsh dies, and there's no longer a good personal reason for Osborne to attack Marsh. Right? That's gone. And so all of a sudden, this motivation for revising Jurassic dinosaurs mostly goes away. He didn't not work on it at all, but he took on a number of other projects instead of the Stegosaurus project. And I think that's fairly significant. And so what I, the, the big splash I was going to make was this one. So maybe Osborne did get his hands dirty at Como Bluff. See? That was really, I was going to crush it, and I totally forgot. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>